Hello and welcome to Current News. I am Amrit Upadhyay. In this segment, we will discuss news which are important from the perspective of your examination. The bulletin of the last whole week which might echo in your question papers in the examination hall. So let's first look at the headlines. The Union Cabinet approved major electoral reforms. Government steps up to link voter card with Aadhaar. Youth voting for the first time will get a chance to enroll four times in a year. Meeting held among SCO members on security related issues. First time India hosted the seminar. This time the topic of discussion was securing cyberspace in a threatened environment. Now a black box is set to be made for the earth. The project begins in Tasmania, Australia. People will be responsible for the end of human civilization due to climatic change. Large banks of the country on the path of co-lending model of RBI. In the co-lending model, banks and NBFCs do the work of lending together. The purpose of this model is to provide funding to backward areas. And Supreme Court gives green signal to the widening of three national highways of Char Dham project. The court also acknowledged the strategic importance of these highways. Vehicles will be able to reach India-China border faster. So let's begin with the news of the week. The government has recently given nod to a few reforms related to the elections. The election commission has been in talks with the government for a long time on these reforms. Let's discuss these reforms one at a time. The most important reform is the linking of Aadhaar with the voter card. The main purpose of linking Aadhaar is to prevent duplication of the voter card. After the linking of Aadhaar with the voter card, a person will not be able to get more than one voter card made from different places. However, it is also clear that the condition of linking of Aadhaar will not be mandatory but voluntary. To implement this reform, the government will have to amend the Representation of the People Act of 1951 and the Aadhaar Act of 2016. Let's tell you that the election commission had also started a program to link Aadhaar with voter card in 2015. The name of this program was National Electoral Law Purification and Authentication Program which had to be stopped after an order of the Supreme Court. In fact the Supreme Court in KS Puttaswamy case has decided that Aadhaar should be used on a voluntary basis for availing the benefits of government schemes only. Also the government has made up its mind to simplify the nomination of first time voters now the youth voting for the first time will get a chance to enroll themselves for four time in a year at present according to the representation of the people act a youth of 18 years can enroll only once according to the law only who have completed 18 years of age on or before january 1 of a particular year have a provision to get enrolled in the voter list the cabinet has given green signal to one more election reform the service voter rule related to soldiers will soon be made gender neutral according to the representation of the people act 1951 at present only the wife of a male army officer has the facility to enroll herself as a service voter the government will now propose to amend the 1951 act and the same facility will be given to the husband of a female army officer Bihar's chief minister Mr Nitish Kumar has once again raised the demand for a special status to Bihar after a long gap it is interesting to note that CM Mr Nitish Kumar has been demanding the special category status for Bihar for quite a long time What is SCS that is special category status and why the different states of India keep on demanding it the states which are accorded special status are provided special assistance in terms of funding as compared to the other states in central government sponsored schemes while the other states are funded on the ratio of 7525 or 6040 the ratio is 9010 for the states with special status It means that 90% of a scheme's total budget is provided by the central government and 10% budget has to be provided by the state. The same provision has been made in the case of the northeastern states. 
after the 14th Finance Commission's recommendations, the concept of SCS has been abolished. It implies that now, apart from the 11 states, which have been already accorded the special category status, no new state will be accorded this status. The concept of SCS was introduced in 1969 when the 5th Finance Commission had given its recommendations about providing separate financial assistance to the backward states. In the beginning, SCS status was accorded to Assam, Nagaland and Jammu Kashmir only. Later on, SCS was also accorded to Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand and rest of the northeastern states. According to the Ministry of Home Affairs, these states have been accorded SCS on the basis of five parameters. First, hilly and difficult terrain. Second, low population density or large share of tribal population. Third, a strategic location along neighboring countries' borders. Fourth, economic and infrastructural backwardness. And fifth, non-viable nature of the state's finance. A special category status has not been mentioned in the Constitution of India. Although some special provisions have been made for a few states between Articles 371 to 371J. These provisions are not related to SCS. Under these articles, states like Maharashtra, Gujarat, Nagaland, Assam, Manipur and Andhra Pradesh are covered. The NDPS, that is Narcotics, Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Amendment Bill was passed in the Lok Sabha recently. This bill was introduced in 2021 to correct a drafting error in the 2014 amendment to the Act. Some changes were made to the NDPS Act 1985 in 2014, but in the amendment, a clerical mistake related to numbering occurred. Therefore, by passing this bill, an effort has been made to correct the numbering in the law. But this news is in discussion not for the amendment made, but because it has been considered enforced with retrospective effect. After reading the bill properly, one finds that it will come into force from 2014. The opposition parties are objecting on the issue of the bill being enforced from a retrospective date. The objection is being raised because the NDPS Act is a criminal law and a criminal law or any amendment therein cannot be enforced retrospectively. However, the finance minister has clarified that amendments with retrospective effect to substantive part of criminal law is not permitted, but clarificatory amendment that seeks to remove an obvious mistake is permitted. The same thing has happened in this case too. The bill is not about adding or deleting any new section. The concept of retrospective effect originates from Article 20 of the Indian Constitution. The article says that no person can be punished except in accordance with a law which is in force when the offense is committed. In addition, one cannot be punished more than the punishment prescribed in the law in force at the time of committing an offense. Let's see an example. Suppose person A did an act in 2018 and the act committed was heinous, but it was also outside the law's purview prevalent at that time. Now, the same act is declared a crime by making a law in 2021. In such a situation, person A cannot be held guilty for the act committed in 2018. This clearly implies that a criminal law cannot be considered to be in force from a retrospective date. However, general law, civil law or tax laws may be enforced retrospectively. Both the points have been considered right by the Supreme Court and the high courts in their different decisions. Recently, a parliamentary panel on budget expenditure in Ladakh presented its report in the parliament. According to this report, only 27% of the amount allocated to the Ladakh administration through the budget of 2021 has been utilized. According to the Ministry of Home Affairs, the reason behind less expenditure has been the lack of technical field staff and labor. The construction work in Ladakh is dependent on labor coming from other states. However, the workers could not come here due to the restrictions imposed during the lockdown. Therefore, the tender of local projects has also been affected. The report also talks about the issue of very low connectivity in rural areas. Along with this, the Ministry of Home Affairs has been asked 
to increase the strength of engineering cadre and financial power of Ladakh Autonomous Hill Development Council. The Autonomous Hill Development Council has two branches in this union territory, one for Leh and the other one for Kargil. This report of the panel in the Rajya Sabha has come at a time when different civil societies are continuously raising the demand for making Ladakh a state. Along with this, the Kargil Democratic Alliance is also demanding the inclusion of Ladakh in the sixth schedule of the constitution. The sixth schedule deals with articles 2442 and 275.1 of the constitution. This schedule contains provisions related to the administration of tribal areas of four states. These states are Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura and Mizoram. It should also be noted that under this schedule, autonomous development councils are formed so that local communities can get some autonomy. According to the sixth schedule, the governor of the concerned state can constitute autonomous regions. Therefore, the same demand is now being raised for Ladakh due to said powers and the benefits of sixth schedule. To clarify further, if Ladakh is to be included in the sixth schedule, then the parliament can do the same by using ordinary law. It means that an amendment made in the sixth schedule is not considered an amendment to the constitution under article 368. Recently, the National Security Council Secretariat in collaboration with Data Security Council of India, that is DSCI, organized a seminar on security related issues for Shanghai Cooperation Organizations or SCO's representatives. Securing cyberspace in contemporary threat environment was the seminar's main theme. India has hosted such a seminar for the first time after assuming the chairmanship of SCO's RADS in October 2021. In this seminar, issues of critical importance like strategies, cyber terrorism, ransomware and digital forensics were discussed. RATS Executive Committee representatives participate in this seminar. RATS or Regional Anti-Terrorist Structure is a body of Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It was established by the member countries in 2001. Its headquarters are at Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. The body's main role is to coordinate among the member countries in the fight against terrorism, separatism and extremism. In the beginning of this news, the name of DSCI or Data Security Council of India was mentioned. The council is a not-for-profit industrial body which was formed in India for data protection. NASCOM, that is National Association of Software and Services Companies, had established DSCI. The objective of DSCI is to create a secure and reliable cyberspace with augmented functionalities. TechSagar is one of the major initiatives of DSCI and it has been developed in collaboration with National Cyber Security Coordinator. TechSagar is a repository which contains information on India's cyber tech capabilities. It also has information related to Internet of Things, Artificial Intelligence, Robotics, Augmented Reality, Virtual Reality, etc. Recently, a referendum was held in New Caledonia to attain independence from France. An interesting point is that New Caledonia's majority population has voted against this referendum, despite the fact that many protests demanding independence have been taking place in this region since a long time. This directly implies that New Caledonia's citizens want their region to remain a French territory for the time being. French President Emmanuel Macron has welcomed the referendum's outcome in view of the decolonization's efforts and China's interference in Indo-Pacific, the referendum was carried out under the United Nations supervision. Earlier, similar referendums also took place in New Caledonia in 2018 and 2020. It must be noted that New Caledonia is a group of islands located in the South Pacific Ocean. It is an archipelago which lies in Australia's northeast. The island is situated in the South Pacific Ocean and is thousands of miles away from the French mainland. It was colonized by France in the 19th century. Even today, it is a French territory and French military base is operational here. New Caledonia is part of Pacific Ocean's Melanesia. Melanesia also includes New Guinea, Solomon, Vanuatu, and Fiji. Micronesia is situated in north of Melanesia. 
and it includes Marshall Islands, Palau, Caroline Islands, and Kiribati. Polynesia is situated in the east of Micronesia and Melanesia. Polynesia includes islands like Hawaii, Tuvalu, Tonga, Tahiti, Society, New Zealand, Cook, Easter, and Samoa Islands, etc. Let us apprise you of the fact that various independence movements are being organized in different countries of the world. California has also been demanding independence from America, and for this purpose, CalExit movement is being organized. Similarly, a few Northwest American states are demanding Cascadia's independence. Zapatista in Mexico, Catalonia in Spain, Wallonia in Belgium, Artsakh in Azerbaijan, French island Corsica in Mediterranean Sea, and Kurdistan in Middle East are some other regions which are also demanding independence. Whenever a plane crashes, the administration starts looking for the black box. The black box provides the last minute information about the aircraft which helps in determining the crash's actual cause. Scientists are now planning to build an earth black box based on this concept. In fact, this black box is not being built for any aircraft but for studying climate change. This bus-shaped black box will record weather's changing patterns. In addition, it will record data related to rising ocean temperature, atmospheric CO2 concentration, and biodiversity's loss. Data of about 50 years will be recorded in this machine. According to scientists, due to climate change, if human civilization ceases to exist in future, then the reasons behind it can be determined with the recorded data's help. The new concept-based black box will be 33 feet long and will be made of 3-inch thick steel. It is likely to be completed by 2022. However, scientists have already started collecting climate-related data which is being saved on a solar-powered hard drive. This black box is being built in Tasmania, Australia. Tasmania has been chosen for geopolitical and environmental safety reasons. It is an Australian island which is located in south of Australia. Bass Strait lies between Australia and Tasmania. It should be noted that a black box is an electronic recording device. It is of two types, flight data recorder and cockpit voice recorder. The flight data recorder records the recent history of a flight, while the cockpit voice recorder records sounds including the pilot's conversations. SFTDA, commonly known as hing farming, is being promoted in a farm situated in Himachal Pradesh's Lahol Valley. The promising fact is that since the beginning of SFTDA's farming, its production has increased significantly. As a result, experts are assuming that perhaps SFTDA will now be produced on a large scale in India itself. Ferula SFTDA is being cultivated for producing SFTDA in Motilal farm situated in Lahol Valley. SFTDA farming is part of IHBT or Institute of Himalayan Bioresource Technologies Initiative. In India, the plant seeds were imported from Iran in 2018 by IHBT. According to the ICAR, in India, the plant seeds have been imported for the first time in the last 30 years. For your information, every year India imports 1,200 to 1,600 tons of raw asafoetida, valuing about $100 million annually. India imports asafoetida from countries like Iran, Afghanistan, and Uzbekistan. Ferula asafoetida is an evergreen plant and it is considered as the source of asafoetida. It is believed that Ferula asafoetida is originally a plant of European countries. Asafoetida is prepared from the resin gum derived from this plant's roots and it takes around 5 years. The desert and cold areas are very suitable for this plant and for this reason, its farming has been started in the Himalayan region of India. Desert and loamy soils are considered suitable for this plant. This plant cannot be grown in shady areas, that is, direct sunlight is crucial for this plant's growth. In addition, a gap of 2 to 5 feet must be kept between two plants. Asafoetida falls in the category of aromatic plants. Asafoetida is used in India to enhance the food's taste. It is also very effective in dealing with health-related problems like indigestion. 
Asafoetida also has antibiotic properties and therefore it is used in preparing various medicines. It is believed that antiviral drugs can be prepared from Asafoetida's roots and these drugs are helpful in preventing influenza and flu. Due to its contraceptive properties, pregnant women are advised not to use Asafoetida. It is also used in preparing the medicines prescribed for cancer treatment. In the recent times, the big banks of the country are adopting the co-lending model of the RBI. Let us remind you that the central bank had proposed the co-lending model last year to extend financial help to the unserved and underserved areas. Recently, under this model, the State Bank of India tied up with Adani Capital. As the name itself suggests, the co-lending model is a system in which two entities provide loans together. According to the notification issued last year, under this model, banks and registered NBFCs, that is non-banking financial companies, jointly give loans to unserved and underserved areas like priority sectors. The RBI also allows housing finance companies to join this league. Banks and NBFCs can start lending under this model only after a prior agreement. According to the rules of this model, NBFCs will have to lend at least 20% in the loan, meaning the risk of 80% or less will remain with the big bank. In simple terms, if the repayment of any loan gets stuck, the bank will have a higher risk share in it. As per RBI, priority sector lending can be included in the unserved and underserved areas. Sectors like agriculture, MSME, export credit, education, housing, social infrastructure and renewable energy come under the purview of priority sector lending. Recently, Prime Minister Narendra Modi addressed an event on depositors' first guaranteed time-bound deposit insurance payment up to 5 lakh. The scope of bank deposit insurance was also talked about in this event. Notably, the government had increased the deposit insurance limit from Rs 1 lakh to Rs 5 lakh last year. Along with this, another change was brought this year when the deadline for payment of insurance was fixed to 90 days. For this, changes were made in the Deposit Insurance and Credit Guarantee Corporation Act of 1961. Now let's understand Bank Deposit Insurance Program in layman's terms. We deposit our money in banks in order to get security and interest. But sometimes the financial condition of the banks becomes such that the banks are unable to return the money of their depositors and their money gets stuck. Therefore, to cover for such a situation, the government gives an insurance cover for deposits. That is, the money is returned to the customers up to a certain limit. Earlier, this limit was 30,000 rupees which was increased to 1 lakh in 1991 and to 5 lakh in 2020. This means that in case of bankruptcy of banks, depositors can claim their total deposits or maximum of Rs 5 lakh. On the other hand, in case of deposits up to Rs 6 lakh, the person will be able to claim only up to Rs 5 lakh and he will suffer a loss of Rs 1 lakh. In the past, the government had taken the decision to increase the insurance cover after taking cognizance of cases of Punjab and Maharashtra Cooperative Bank and Lakshmi Vilas Bank. There is a separate agency working in this field named as Deposit Insurance and Credit Guarantee Corporation. The corporation is a statutory body and a subsidiary of the RBI. RBI has talked about starting a framework for NBFCs on the lines of PCA that is prompt corrective action applicable on banks. Monitoring of NBFCs will be strengthened through this framework. Also, the financial condition and governance related issues of NBFCs can be improved just like banks. RBI will implement this framework from October 1 next year. According to RBI, the new framework will be applicable to all deposit-taking and non-deposit-taking NBFCs. Along with this, it will also be applicable to investment and credit firms, core investment firms, infrastructure debt funds, infrastructure finance firms, and microfinance institutions. However, housing finance firms and the NBFCs that do not take public funds will be kept out of its purview. 
Let us remind you that the PCA framework was started by RBI in the year 2002. The objective of this framework is to act swiftly to reform banks having poor financial health. If a bank comes under the ambit of the PCA framework, it means that now the RBI will continuously supervise that bank and will also take necessary action when needed. The main objective of the PCA framework is to monitor the problem of non-performing assets in India's banking sector. Banks are brought under the purview of PCA framework on the basis of the asset quality of banks, profitability and the risk level related to capital, etc. To address these risks, the RBI may impose some mandatory and discretionary restrictions. Mandatory restrictions include restrictions on dividends and expanding of its branches, restrictions related to strategy, governance, capital, credit, and market risk are kept under discretionary restrictions. Recently, the Supreme Court allowed the widening project of the three national highways included in the Chardham project. These three highways run from Rishikesh to Mana, Rishikesh to Gangotri and Tanakpur to Pithoragad. The court has accepted the Ministry of Defense's argument that these projects are of strategic importance. In addition, widening of these highways is required as it will help the armed forces and equipments to reach the Indochina border areas at the earliest. It is noteworthy that the matter was placed before the court due to the environmental concerns related to the widening of these highways. In the latest decision, the Supreme Court has modified its own order given earlier. The court has allowed the government to construct a 10-meter wide road. Last year, the court had instructed the government to construct these highways as per the Ministry of Highways Circular of 2018 in which it was decided to keep the road 5.5 meters wide. But the Ministry of Highways made changes in the circular in December 2020, and it has allowed the road to be 10 meters wide in border areas. Therefore, the matter was pending in the court. As per the Supreme Court's order, these highways can now be constructed on double lane with paved shoulder system means double line carriageway of 7 meters and paved way of 1.5 meters on both sides of the road. The Chardham project is also associated with Chardham's temples. The temples included in the Chardham are Yamunotri, Gangotri, Kedarnath and Badrinath. Yamunotri temple is dedicated to the goddess Yamuna of India. This temple is situated near the Rawai valley. On the other hand, Gangotri temple is dedicated to the goddess Ganga and it is located in Uttarkashi. The Ganga river originates from Gomuk, which is located a few kilometers away from Uttarkashi. Badrinath or Badri Narayan temple is built on the banks of river Alaknanda and it is situated at an altitude of 3100 meters in the Garhwal Himalayas. Badrinath Nagar is situated between Nar and Narayan mountain range. Badrinath temple is dedicated to Lord Vishnu and it was built by Adi Shankaracharya in the 8th century. Kedarnath temple is dedicated to Lord Shiva and it is situated at an altitude of more than 3500 meters in the Garhwal Himalayas. This temple is situated near Chorabari glacier which is the origin source of Mandakini river. Kedarnath is one of the 12 Jyotirlingas of India and it is also a part of Panch Kedar. Panch Kedar includes Kedarnath, Madhmaheshwar, Tungnath, Rudranath and Kalpnath. Let us now look at the five questions based on the bulletin. Questions for this series are, first question is, it is native to European countries. A famous product called Hing is prepared from the resin gum extracted from the roots of this plant and it takes about five years. Desert and cold areas are quite suitable for this plant's growth. Desert and loamy soils are considered suitable for this plant. Direct sunlight is required for this plant's growth. Besides, a gap of 2 to 5 feet must be kept between two plants. Which plant is being discussed in the above paragraph? Butea monosperma, Ferula acephoetida, Nephenthes khasiana, or Angelica glauca? 
नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज अकॉर्डिंग टू द मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ होम अफेयर्स स्पेशल कैटेगरी स्टेटस टू अ स्टेट इज अकॉर्डेड ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ फाइव पैरामीटर्स वन हिली एंड डिफिकल्ट टेरेन टू लो पॉपुलेशन डेंसिटी और लार्ज शेयर ऑफ ट्राइबल पॉपुलेशन थ्री स्ट्रैटेजिक लोकेशन अलॉन्ग नेबरिंग कंट्रीज बॉर्डर्स फोर इकोनॉमिक एंड इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चरल बैकवर्डनेस फाइव नॉन वायबल नेचर ऑफ द स्टेट्स फाइनेंशियल कंडीशन सिलेक्ट द करेक्ट पैरामीटर्स फ्रॉम द अब वन टू एंड थ्री ओनली टू थ्री एंड फोर ओनली वन थ्री एंड फोर ओनली और वन टू थ्री फोर एंड फाइव नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज द लोकल एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन ऑफ अ सिटी हैज स्टार्टेड अ स्कीम फॉर द पीपल बिलो द पॉवर्टी लाइन For selection of eligible beneficiary under the scheme the people have been mandatorily asked to link their aadhar card with the concerned schemes portal please answer under which article of the constitution this order can be challenged by the people in the court considering it as a violation of rights article 21 article 14 article 15 or article 19 next question is consider the following statements one the union government can enforce a parliamentary act with retrospective effect two only acts can be enforced with retrospective effect not the rules notified by a ministry which of the above statement or statements is or are correct only one only two both one and two or neither one nor two last question is consider the following pairs place in news and location 1 catalonia iberian peninsula 2 artsakh united states 3 valonia western europe 4 kurdistan middle east which of the above pairs are correctly matched 1 2 and 3 only 1 3 and 4 only 2 3 and 4 only or all of the above that is all for this bulletin in the end let us have a look at few more events of the last week in other news recently the cabinet approved the proposal related to increasing the legal age of marriage of women from 18 to 21 years for this purpose a bill will also be brought soon in parliament to make necessary changes in laws like prohibition of child marriage act 2006 and hindu marriage act 1955 For your information the recommendation to increase the minimum legal age of marriage of women was given to the Niti Aayog by the task force led by Jaya Jetli Recently the Supreme Court granted permission to organize Maharashtra's famous bullock cart race it is noteworthy that the competition was banned in 2017 the Bombay High Court had banned it on the grounds of preventing cruelty to animals to prevent cruelty to animals the prevention of cruelty to animals act 1960 exists in India Mr Harshvardhan Shringla foreign secretary of India said that the India Bangladesh friendship pipeline can be inaugurated by 2022 the two countries had signed this development project in 2018 the project which cost 346 crore rupees will integrate the energy needs of both the countries under this project siliguri located in india will be connected to parvatipur located in dinajpur bangladesh In the United Nations Security Council Niger and Ireland's resolution on the issue of climate change was voted recently. Proposal was related to link climate with security. The resolution could not be passed in the Security Council as the permanent member Russia vetoed it and China abstained from the voting. India can cast its vote in opposition of the resolution. Niger has been given the presidency of UNSC for December 2021. Recently the United Nations General Assembly has granted observer status to the International Solar Alliance. The International Solar Alliance Foundation was led jointly by India and France at the Paris summit held in 2015. Initially the organization included those countries which are located wholly or partially between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. However at present its membership is open to all member states of the United Nations. The granting of observer status to an institution implies that it will have access to most of the general assembly meetings and some other important documents. After the recent Nagaland's Mon district incident there is anger among the Konyak people. Konyak union has urged its people to not cooperate with the armed forces at all. Konyak tribe is a part of the Naga group. A large population of this tribe lives in Nagaland's Mon district. 
They are considered to be traditional hunters, although they have also started farming nowadays. In addition, they are progressing very well in the field of handicrafts. Konyak people are also infamous as headhunters. In reply to a question asked in Parliament, the Environment Minister presented data on the killing of wildlife and its illegal trade. As per the data, more than 2,000 cases have been reported between 2018 and 2020. These cases have been registered by the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau. The WCCB is a statutory body constituted under the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. This act advocates for a central bureau for tigers and the other threatened species. We know it as the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau. National Energy Conservation Week was organized as a part of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav from 8th to 14th December 2021. This special program was organized by the Ministry of Power. During this period, a program was also organized on the Samiksha, that is Small and Medium Enterprises Energy Efficiency Knowledge Sharing. It is a special platform on which different organizations are advised to lay emphasis on promoting the use of clean energy.